Hello everybody, um, my name is Manish Joshi and uh, I kind of set up the Glasgow Commonwealth South Group about three, four weeks ago and it's fantastic to see so many people um, here in this room. I guess you guys all want a society, an economy that puts all of us first um, and just want to thank you guys for making the time to come out tonight. Um, I want to just invite up on stage a couple of team members from the Commonwealth and a board member, Pat Kane. So we've got Pat here at the back and Katie and Michael. Um, so we'll have a time of kind of input from these guys up here, Q&A from yourselves, um, and then we're actually breaking into some smaller groups and we've got some questions that we really want you guys to start working through in terms of what your, you think the priorities are here in the south side of Glasgow and where you'd like to see this group go. Um, we're in our infancy, uh, looking for people tonight who want to volunteer to get involved in terms of an organising committee, helping with social media, helping to organise events um, and various things. So as we're talking and as you're listening, have a think if you want to get a bit more involved. Um, we're being live streamed, so hello to any common wheelers that are <laughs> watching us um, and uh, just thank you to the guys for that. And if anyone's got any questions, um, you know, I think it's a really informal forum. Um, you kind of feel free to pop up your hand, but um, I'm going to hand over to the guys now. Who My name's Katie. I'm one of the team members at Commonweal. Um, just to echo some of the stuff that Manish was saying, it's amazing to see so many people here tonight. It's amazing to see this level of engagement. We were totally overwhelmed in the days after the referendum. Um, it was actually my email that was on the website. And <laughs> Fortunately or unfortunately, over that weekend, I had more than a thousand emails from discreet people offering their help, offering their resources, interested in getting involved in any way they could. Um, so it's really a testament to the communities um, across Scotland that have totally self-organised, totally brought groups of people together in you know, venues like this to have a conversation about what's, what they want to see in their community and what Commonweal can do for them and what sort of vision they see for Commonweal across Scotland. Um, so yeah, if we want to get started, maybe at this end of the room, just giving a quick introduction of who you are. I've never been politically engaged before. Um, I just, I always went with the party line, politicians are all liars, so what's the point in voting for any of them if you can't, if you can't trust them? And I kind of still feel that way, but at the same time, I think throughout the Yes campaign, spending a lot of time researching different things and kind of taking the good and the bad from from all politicians and their views I, it just made me think that there is a better solution or there's something out there that can make society a good place to live for everybody and i think i've related to the common wheel common wheel more than i've related to any other kind of policy or kind of vision that i've seen and hopefully i can add something to that as well as part of i have to be honest i have joined other groups since the referendum, I seem to be in everything at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> um, obviously, I think we're all looking for a way to make Scotland a better place, and we've, I think, probably all decided that we, if, if the politicians aren't going to do it for us, we'll have to uh, roll up our sleeves and do it ourselves, and, and I'm ready for that. I was at the Commonweal launch in the Arches last year and I thought kind of after the referendum this seemed like the best way to keep being politically active. Um, I just wanted to get involved on a more local level and kind of actions speak louder than words I guess. Mm. Um, just interested in local democracy and how practically we're going to make this work. I'm worried that a lot of the Commonweal ideas seem to be predicated on a yes victory uh, and I'm wondering what it is we can do that's going to salvage the, uh, the common real ideas at this time. I'm a disillusioned ex-Labour voter looking for an alternative. <laughs> First of all, Robin McAlpine, speaking at the uh, Radical Independence Conference last year, and his vision for an egalitarian society and uh, for social justice was pretty compelling. And I've tried to keep up with common real ever since. Um, I, uh, I've been busy with involving and empowering people in decisions that affect their lives for the last 10 years in my work world and in my pub world as well. I'm just really glad to see that it seems to be tipping onto the other side where it's becoming real and just want to be a part of it. Yeah, there's just a few people at the back. I have to confess to not knowing a huge amount about the Commonweal. I only really heard about it towards the end of the referendum campaign. I have to also confess that I did vote yes, but I kind of sat back and let everybody else do something and I just assumed things would happen 
and didn't really get involved. And I'm so bitterly disappointed that I'm desperately trying to find something hmm? to move forward with. <laughs> I just want to be part of something that doesn't exist just in social media. I'm interested to see how we can get some of these big ideas we had during the time of the referendum worked out on a local and a practical level. Okay, thank you everybody. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a mixture of, of sentiments in the room. Some of it's about getting more educated and informing yourself about what this organisation is about and other people already know quite a bit. Um, I'd say the most common question we get as, as staff of Commonweal is, so what, what is Commonweal? Um, and so hopefully tonight we'll be able to answer some of those questions, explain to you a little bit more about how we see ourselves functioning within a Scottish democracy and as citizens, and, and hopefully give you some ideas of how you can get involved for those of you who do, uh, do want to. So I'd like to introduce my colleague, Michael Gray, um, who's just going to give you a short presentation about our work. Thanks. Hi everybody, um, don't like stages. Um, I think that was a great start. I think it's important to practice what you preach as an organisation and not just speak at people, but ask people what they want to hear first. And if a lot of people came here for more information about Commonweal, hopefully that's what we can start by providing people um, before we break into sort of smaller groups and ask what we can do practically. Um, so the presentation has three sections. First, uh, who are we um, as an organisation? Secondly, uh, what are we doing at the moment? Um, and thirdly, what can you do? And how can you get involved or perhaps structure sort of local events, campaigns um, and discussions to take the ideas that we all uh, believe in forward at a local and national level? Um, but first of all, um, what is Commonweal and where do we come from? Uh, so Commonweal is an old Scots phrase uh, meaning sort of shared wealth or the sort of well-being of the community. Um, and it started in 2013 as an idea during the referendum campaign, essentially asking a really important question, how can we create a better country? And what happened was we got a phenomenal response from lots of academics, lots of thinkers and, and citizens across Scotland who had different ideas on policies or practical ways that they could make their community or the country better. Um, and we put that together into a book launch, some of the best ideas explained in a way that that's easy to read and, and access for lots of people. We've got some copies along at the back um, if people want to get a copy on the way out. Um, and there's a growing interest in what's been described as an all of us first approach to politics, one that brings people together into a community. Um, and one of the reasons I think this has been successful... Oh, sit down a little. I am quite, lan I, I am quite, I am quite lanky. Um, Maybe it makes it a bit easier to see, I, I don't mind. Um, so three central aspects to it, I think, that it's practical. The ideas that are involved in Commonweal have worked elsewhere, in other countries or already in Scotland, which means we can do them here. Um, and secondly, they're positive. It's, um, as Katie mentioned, about what uh, constructive approach can we take to problems and create, some, create a practical solution. And thirdly, they're pluralistic. So we're not looking at, at labeling people or uh, looking at people based on their background or certain organizations. Um, it's about bringing people together who have shared interests and shared objectives and working together um, with people maybe who have different uh, views on different issues. Um, so where, where, what's happened since then? Well, since the referendum, there's been an influx of interest. We've got a board of 16 um, sort of inspirational figures from across a range of areas in Scotland. Pat's one of them here today. Um, and we've also developed a staff team of 12 who are working on a range of um, ambitious projects in the area. And we've also run a successful fundraiser. We're halfway towards the sort of £25,000 a month objective that we've aimed to sort of run the organisation in terms of supporting groups across the country. Um, and all of this is kind of condensed into the leaflet that Kerry handed out and um, that sets out some of the areas that we're working on. And sadly, because I have to plug the, uh, the sort of direct debit sort of form in the back and you can like do a monthly donation. And the, the reason we've set it up like that is so we are um, responsible for or responsible to people who support the Commonweal as members, as local groups rather than chasing corporate funding or, you know, some kind of like sugar daddy who can give you a lot of money and then might disappear. You know, we want to be sustainable. We want to be effective. So we need financial support, but we want that relationship to be with like-minded people who share a common aim, not because, you know, they're in it for an ego trip or any other reason. 
Second, what are we doing now? So we've all got high aspirations here. We want to change our communities and the country that we live in. Um, so for that, we, we need to take a serious approach across a range of areas. That includes research, um, advocacy work in the parliament, media work, and of course, local and national campaigning. Um, so to take those one by one, we've established a policy unit which has two staff based in Edinburgh, and their role is going to be to link some of the best academic and research work, um, put it together, link those people together, and get it published, get it out there, and get it read and accessible. Um, so there's going to be far more work in that area that was, that was done during the referendum um, in terms of the Com Wheel book, and looking at how those can create policy solutions now for local and national government in Scotland. So the, the person at the back asked, what happens after the referendum? Well, we can look at two areas. We can look at the powers we have at the moment, and we can look at the powers that Scotland will hopefully get through the Smith Commission and think, what can we do in the areas like health and education and housing and food production? What can we do if areas of taxation, land reform, local democracy? There's huge areas here for research and work, and that's what the policy team is going to be focused on. And that will link directly to those who currently make decisions um, about, about policy. Um, so we've got Ash, um, who's working for Commonweal, started uh, just last week in Parliament, trying to link all these groups at a local level to decision makers at the Parliament, to the people who are passing legislation right now. And there's some areas where we can set short and long-term objectives about things we want to change. So in the next year, there's going to be a community empowerment bill at Holyrood, which is going to look at basically reforming local government in Scotland. Um, and there's an opportunity there to move power downwards below local authority level, so it's linked into to communities at more local level, so you have more control over spending in areas like that. That's one example where we can, can advocate change um, as local groups and as a national campaign. Or an issue like land reform, and thinking about you know, the concentration of ownership that there is at the moment in Scotland, and thinking about how you can maybe give more opportunities for people to buy up like small lot holdings like we have in other countries. Um, so those are some short-term examples. A number of people mentioned austerity, and, and the sad reality is without control over social security and taxation, it is difficult to solve that problem with a, a more progressive system. But we can alleviate some of these measures with powers we have at the moment, which is why we'll be looking at areas like food policy, supporting local food co-ops, so it's not just all down to philanthropy and the goodwill of people with, with very little to spare through, um, through food banks. And areas like housing, where hopefully if we have housing benefit devolved, and we have some control over housing policy, we can do something uh, to help people um, who are vulnerable or, or in poverty. And the third area uh, to link into is, is what we're doing about sort of media and information. So this came up time and time again about access to information, about fair coverage of local community campaigns. Um, and what we've got now is um, a common space team. So in early December, um, we're going to launch a website um, called Common Space that will provide a quality news service and um, that will be a direct link for, for community groups um, like Commonwealth Southside and across the country to get information about what's happening about sort of politics and social issues, but also to pass on information about issues that are happening locally that they feel aren't uh, receiving the right recognition, like local campaigns or the impact of cuts or decisions that are being made. Um, and I'm one of those sort of five people who are working on that aspect of the project. Um, so that site will launch mainly as a news service, but it will also have an important organising function in it. So in the, like, essentially in the same way that social media operates, except focused on politics for political campaign groups. So you'll be able to go on the site and organise and communicate with other people, to network with other people in an online space, um, which has been useful. But more importantly than that is what happens in real life. Um, and in real space and time, um, because we all know that obviously social media and online has its limits. Um, and that, that is why you know, the most important part about Commonweal is local groups and local activity, um, which are currently self-funded and self-organised and has brought everyone here today. Um, and the ethos of the organisation and the people that are working in all those areas will always be, be linked and responsible for, for the needs and interests of those local groups across the country. So essentially, like, all those groups or are, are individuals are funded through the sort of generosity of the of people who support the organisation. So the work we do um, is obviously dependent on, on the success of those local groups. The success of the organisation and being able to have influence is dependent on everyone here in this room and in the other events uh, that we're doing across Scotland. Um, so basically, all the work we do should be there to support local groups and whatever any individual who's involved in it or organiser wants those people to do. So, you know email and phone all the time, please. 
And that links into the third section, which is more about sort of local organising and what everyone here can do um, at a local level. And obviously there's events like this um, all across the country. It's been inspiring, like there's towards sort of 30 local groups been set up in, in around a month and a half and growing still. Um, so we're still working through some of the issues about what support do people want, what support do people need, um, trying not to rush it too fast so it's not just imposed um, because any successful campaign of this nature has to be decentralised and not, you know, organised uh, by, you know, a small handful of people. It has to be organised by thousands of people. Um, and that's what we're hoping to achieve by supporting local groups. Um, and we also recognise the sort of diversity of, of the reasons people came along today. So, and we think that's a great thing. It replicates some of the best parts about the referendum campaign. Um, and, like, that's a huge opportunity uh, to sort of bring people together. Um, whether it's um, you know opportunities for political education, people learning more, whether it's having campaigns of action, or whether it's having social discussions, so we think uh, communal local groups can encompass all those areas. So if you're looking at political education, some groups like in Portobello and elsewhere have been host hosting sort of reading groups. Um, some are already looking at how they can uh, sort of lobby or link into local officials or councillors to get them to speak on certain issues, um, or maybe it's interesting to have a like a lecture series on a certain issue people want to learn more about, like be it economics or local government um, or anti-poverty campaigning. Um, it's amazing how much everyone learned over the past two years, um, and that doesn't have to stop. Secondly, campaigning and taking action. Um, so obviously to change things, uh, we have to act. And as the person said, you know, action, uh, not words. And um, that will be something that I'm sure a lot of people locally will want to do, whether it's, you know, a local issue about a housing project that's being developed or about affordable childcare or about you know like what's happening with a local premises or building or like community space and might all be local issues that people decide they want to take up at a, a local basis um, so that can happen locally but also um, there's no sort of false division of labor between you know what's a national project and a local project like um, working on national issues is something that everyone can do as well and be it the bills that are going through Holyrood or even global issues um, like TTIP, for instance, is something that you know the local and global aren't that, that far apart. And there might be people who want to organize around international issues. It all depends on what people decide later on and what happens in the South Side. And another aspect of local groups, obviously, which is the, sometimes the best and, and most fun part, is how it brings people together. Um, and how it can be an enjoyable experience just by bringing people together around sort of common goals. Um, it doesn't all have to be hard work. Um, as long as like the organisation's enjoyable and people actually like enjoy participating and meet people, um, that's also a good thing. Um, and this is another aspect that we've kind of been looking about in different areas, and that's like how you have community spaces. Um, and different areas are looking at this in different ways, thinking about how they access a, a sort of central hub or community space to make this happen. Um, so there's questions about that, obviously about whether it's possible in a certain area, how many people you have involved, and whether people have the time uh, to commit to it. So some groups are looking at it in a different way. Um, in Edinburgh, North and Leith, um, they've got access to a local cafe venue where the, the owner is interested in supporting the work. Um, so they're opening Area C Cafe on Leaf Walk as an out-of-hours commons. Um, so when it's not open as a cafe, they're going to use it for meetings and socials. Um, in Glasgow, there's been some development about looking at having a purpose-designed building for Commonweal um, across the whole city for organising events and for so people can access it for, for larger events. It might also, people here might be interested in you know, an arrangement for local venue, um, for things specifically about the south side, and that's once again up to people here. So to conclude, hopefully that's been a, a useful and, and sort of short introduction to what we're doing or where Commonweal came from, what we're doing at the moment, where the next steps are, and importantly, how you can get involved at a local level. Um, so we've got 10 minutes for question and answers, and then afterwards we're going to be breaking out into smaller groups so you guys can talk to one another, um, pose questions to one another, and yeah, just have conversations and debate. Um, so first question, if, if people want to start putting their hands up. Yep, your man in the back. You, sir, with the white T-shirt. Oh, you're getting the microphone. Um, you've talked a little about the international interest in the referendum, but what we tend to be a bit sniffy about is the English interest in the referendum. Um, have you any thoughts 
on yes. how we can start to, I thought you might, how we, how we can start to recapture some of that energy from well, people like Owen Jones, who was, who, who, who was, always, who was always, always a no, but always has uh, interesting things to say. Okay, I can answer that. Um, uh, Willie Sullivan is on the Commonweal Board. Willie Sullivan is also the Scottish representative of something called Compass. And Compass is a kind of very interesting organisation in relation to the Labour Party, but it's sort of moving away above and beyond that. Um, there's a lot of people, whether they be English uh, regionalists, people who are interested in English and fe federalism or federalising England, um, there are people who are um, involved in the left unity campaigns. Um, there's a lot of people who were inspired by uh, the, uh, uh, the organisation and the commitment and the involvement and the level, the intellectual and conceptual level of the Yes campaign, and I think they want to be, they want to learn from us. Now, the, I think those conversations can happen. I think there's a lot of people who are looking at the kind of horizontal way that, that we, we did things. Um, and I think, um, I mean, for example, I think we've, we have a, 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 an organisation which just popped up in my inbox today called um, Rethink Trident, which is essentially the Bairns Not Bombs agenda, mm. but uh, in a cross-party, all-party way revived beyond not the S, not the CND but just a completely wide wide ranging organization called Rethink Trident. So I think we need I think it's absolutely we should completely regard uh, English uh, bottom up horizontal radicalism um, from wherever it comes from um, as part of our wider process. Uh, and and if, I, I also if there are exemplars going on in England, there's no point in not bringing those into the discussion as much as we find exemplars in Scandinavia or Iceland or Argentina or South America or whatever. I totally agree, totally, 100% agree. And just from a Commonwealth perspective, um, it's not rare for us to get emails from communities south of the border asking us for more information about Commonweal and if they would, if we would be interested in, in helping them educate themselves a little bit more about Commonweal policy. Is that, I mean, obviously the same agitation and communities does exist there. Yeah. It's just that it's we've we've sort of got that little catalyst that made all of us work together in this short space of time for this one thing, and then it blossomed into this national energy um, and engagement and education. Um, and I guess one of the things I would say is it's, it's hard to tell right now where that's going to go. Yeah, I, I always felt that we were ahead in terms of having a plan. But uh, our plan didn't really work, did it? <laughs> well, interesting. I wonder who won <laughs> at the moment. Who won? Interesting. You know, I mean, they might win. They might have the legislature, but I don't think they have anywhere near the kind of awareness and uh, forward-lookingness. So we'll see. Next question. Um, give someone else a, a wee chance. <laughs> Anybody else? Yep. Thank you. Um, you were talking about media and new ways of having relationships with media, sort of obviously both way and dialogue. And I'm wondering how we prevent ourselves from becoming or remaining an echo chamber. How we reach out to people who don't n normally engage with uh, internet type media um, and who do rely on watching the news at six o'clock for their information. Right. To start with, we're looking at having a quality news service that's information-based. So it's slightly different from a lot of the successful uh, sort of comment and blog sites that have been before. Because um, I think a lot of the time, a lot of the stuff online is quite reactive. So we get the news um, like prescribed by some of the more mainstream institutions um, rather than having a news gathering operation um, where you know we have sources and we have breaking stories and exclusives and new information essentially. Um, from from an online uh, setup, so hopefully that's one aspect where um, what we do will be something new that complements what's pre-existing, but also a lot of the work that we're doing is will through that be trying to set agendas, and um, so we'll be wanting other media organisations to take the stories that we that we run up, and hopefully they'll be covered in a wider a wider range of um, of, of platforms, and it's not impossible. Um, the reason the, those institutions or corporate groups are very effective at this is because they have professional structures with media teams, with press managers, with press releases that work on distilling information and giving it to the journalists that matter to run those stories. And they place the, place the news and it, it most often gets covered. Um, so we can work on those structures professionally as a team. 
um, and through the information pass it to people that hopefully gets covered more in the mainstream. And Pat mentioned one example, um, which is the Vitol story, which uh, was cooked up in my head as I was sitting freezing cold at Charing Cross Station. Um, and three days later, it was on the national news on Reporting Scotland. Three days later, it was raised um, at Prime Minister's questions to David Cameron um, because it was a really good story. Once it was put up online, the newspapers couldn't ignore it. Um, and hopefully, through, through a small team, we'll in some way be able to set news agendas um, outside our own organisation and outside those echo chambers. I mean, if you look at the way Wik WikiLeaks does what it does and then completely shapes the news agenda, or if you look at the way that the, the Guardian with the Snowden story, uh, then just completely, you know, so hard news, hard investigative news, the process that generates hard investigative news has, is extremely powerful. Um, and so to that extent, the more journalists, the more, the more of these guys afflict the comfortable and comfort the afflicted, you know, uh, the better, the more efficient it will be as a news operation. But I have to be honest with you, I think this is the biggest problem um, you know, I was, the, jo the joke amongst my crew is, yeah, they might, they might give you a bit of this tax, they might give you a bit of that institution, but they'll never give you broadcasting, you know. And I think the Catalonians have their own broadcasting organisation. So uh, uh, most, of the, most of the proposals from the yes uh, side or the strong home rule, home rule parties to the Smith Commission have uh, broadcast, involved broadcasting involved. Let's see if, it's, if it even becomes... I'm sure, I'm sure it's going to be one of the first things not to be picked up. So there's a there's a... The, the mainstream commercial press is just perplexing. I was a found, founder editor of the Sunday Herald. Uh, they've benefited commercially from representing 45% of the population. It's quite perplexing to me. That's why that maybe, maybe, um, it's, you know, I don't know, unthinking ownership that's not based in Scotland, and then I mean that globally, and not just mean doing mean in London. But I think it's a big. I think it's a it's a key issue, um, and um, I could be idealistic about it and say that one of the ways that we ever get to people who only con consumed traditional media that was fear dominated. Um, I mean, the amount of times people have tried to create a daily paper that is not just completely straightforwardly establishment, you know, quite a few times in Scotland, in my, and even in my existence, in my 50 years. So um, I think we have to encourage things like common space and horizontal media, but um, I think it's a real problem. Um, and I, and I think, uh, I think common, if there's any energy behind Commonweal, um, it's to kind of be a kind of a, a brand, a news brand that people can go to to be inspired by, and, um, uh, either to be inspired by it or to get properly angry about both and. Um, but I think I think the mainstream media problem. If some of them die off financially, that probably will help, you know. Uh, and the BBC is chastened. You talk to people in the BBC, and they know uh, that there was a disjunction between, the, to some degree, the Scottish operation and certainly the London operation, and they're a wee bit sensitive about it. So th there might be change there, but not much. It's a big problem. I don't quite have an answer for you. Hi, guys. I'm Kerry. I also work for the Commonweal. Um, mostly I'm going to be working with local groups offering support. Um, I just want to jump in on a more immediate um, local um, form of that qu answer to that question. Um, because something about people not having access to internet is something I care really deeply about. Um, a lot of my family members have no access and they felt really left out of the referendum. So I ended up taking them lots of printouts and sheets and all this kind of thing. So immediately that's something that local groups can do and that's why physical space is so important so that we can help share the ideas because we all know we won the referendum online but not so much offline. So it's something we really need to think about and work on more and of course we're open to suggestions about that. But also the cafe bar in Glasgow, we're hoping to have some computers with like open access so people can come and get like trained up on how to use it and also just come and use it whenever they need it to find their information. Um, and also just in the policy aspect, infrastructure, that's something we can push for a better policy on um, is mm. making sure that there's more access to the internet throughout Scotland for everyone. Okay. Talked Another about media, and you talked about parties and stuff like that. But one of the other things that seemed to come in at the end of the referendum was business, whether that was how the media portrayed what their opinions were or whatever. <laughs> What's the common wheels kind of interaction with businesses, be it small and medium enterprises in, in Scotland or the bigger businesses? Yeah, well, I mean, uh, aspirationally, uh, well, Ivan, Ivan McKee is on the board who was, you know, one of the founders of Business for Scotland. So, uh, and I think in terms of the Commonwealth policy platform, which is to argue for a high-skill, high-wage economy, um, you know, small to medium enterprises are generally regarded internationally as, as the drivers of sustainable employment, um, backed up by regional 
banking uh, with patient capital. Um, so there are, there are a whole load of, I mean, straightforwardly there in terms of the relationship between small and medium enterprises, a banking sector um, and, and regional, local and community empowerment. There's a, I mean, the agenda is there within Commonweal, and it's one of the original things. If you look at, if you look up on the web, you'll find that if you put the words in Robin McAlpine and a blog, and then the words "Come on Scotland," <laughs> you'll find seven of Robin's most brilliant rants about economic illiteracy in Scotland. <laughs> um, and I think that one of the things I would love Commonweal to do is, as part of its sort of um, discussion topics, is to get people to pick up on the general appetite and lust for, for economic literacy. I don't know if you know the work of John Lanchester, uh, the writer in the London Review of Books, but he's written quite a lot of books about how to speak money, how to talk money. There's the positive money movement. Uh, there's the, all the Bitcoin and the cryptography people. That, and this is all happening because we, we are aware that the markets and the bankers and capital um, are these kind of entities that we seem to have no tractability over. So I think one of the things that Conway could certainly do is to is to do that old workers' education thing, actually mm. come back to that again, and to give people basic economic education for the 21st century. I think that would be fantastic. And I think that would maybe help us be a bit more resilient, you know, when uh, our lords and masters decide to scare the pants off us about capital flight and about this, that, and the next thing. I think that, that level of res uh, resilience through economic wisdom is absolutely essential. Uh, are you trying to get Labour out, or are you trying to vote for parties and representatives who will maximise the opportunity for maximum Scottish powers available under the current context at the Westminster election under that system. Now, I think there's a lot of work, for personally, a lot of work to be done by the SNP on that. I think they have to show a certain amount of humility, um, modesty and leadership, which we'll wait and see if it's exerted. I think other parties in the process, the Greens, for example, also have to respond. I think there's the, I think there's the possibility of looking at an argument that says, where are the real home rule parties here? Who do you vote for? That's probably going to be, you know, SNP where they can win, but I think there has to be a representation of either the other parties, SSP Green, and uh, some representatives of the wider movement. So I think, I think we've yet to forge that and answer to that question. Um, but I would love it not just to be a kind of, you must vote SNP because they're the power brokers. No, I'm not, that, I know, didn't that apply that. that. And I think the common <coughs> real perspective would be enable that rich discussion, inform it, bring people together across divides so that we can figure out what to do and then raise that voice. Because I think if the parties are left to themselves, it probably won't happen and it'll probably just be dog eat dog and, and, um, and, and a kind of a, a reduction and a loss of the spirit of the Yes movement. And that would be, I think, a, personally, I think that would be a shame. I think we have a role to play in that. I'm not quite sure what the role is yet. Just you, you'll probably decide it. Just going to check with Esther. Esther, are 10 minutes up? <laughs> <laughs> and on that note, I'm going to pass this over to Pat. Right, I know. <laughs> who's, been, who's been speaking for at least 40 minutes? Right? <laughs> I'm trying to be really, really, really brief. Uh, I have a, I have a, a timer here, which it's either going to be London calling from the Clash or John Coltrane summertime. We'll see what happens. But anyway, it'll ring out. It'll ring out when I hope it's. I hope it's John Coltrane. Um, what is the problem uh, to which um, Commonweal is a solution? Good question, eh? Um, I think one of the problems, uh, and I'll be, it's quite evident that I was part of the Yes campaign. I'm on, I was on the board of Yes Scotland. I did a lot of meetings. Uh, I've been at this for about 20, uh, the goal of independence for 25 years, thoroughly gutted. But uh, I, was, I was used, um, talking about pluralism, my sort of pluralistic attitudes towards the currency, for example, appeared regularly on Better Together leaflets, along with Dennis Canavan's and uh, Patrick Harvey's. And the point I'm making there is, well, what, what is what is the problem to which one of the problems to which Commonweal is a solution is definitely the policy problem. Um, clearly, even if you were a, an indie supporter, indie light didn't work, didn't pull in the middle classes, wasn't enough. So, uh, and part of the, the critique that could be made of the SNP as, as the kind of leader of that particular process was that it was, it was far too hermetic and closed the circle at the top. They weren't fanning out and talking to people and finding out what was there uh, on the ground. Um, but also part of the problem, uh, I mean, for example, even things like TTIP, it's for that, for, for that, to oppose that on a kind of party political ground is actually quite difficult. Maybe the, maybe the Greens can, maybe some in the SNP would, maybe some in the Labour Party would, maybe some in the SNP and the Labour Party wouldn't. 
but to actually find a space that's rich and authentic on which you can build policy that has is well researched uh, and is also in touch with the grassroots, I think is a real prize of contemporary politics and certainly your subscriptions uh, will go towards uh, a think tank process, a research process uh, that will, um, in, in, the, in the manner of the, Treat, the Reed Foundation, which I was also on, on the board of, which uh, Common Goal grew out of, uh, will hopefully provide a kind of a, a body of research that can be providing um, clear, coherent answers to urgent policy questions, but that will be in touch with a mass uh, membership. So I think if one of the things I've learned from the independence referendum was that uh, you don't leave policy to the wonks, uh, you, you emerge policy from expertise meeting popular participation and through structures that make that work. I think that's, that's what Commonweal are trying to build, it's a, a lively, enlivened policy process. Um, I mean, and coming on from that, what, was, what is another problem to which Commonweal might be the solution um, is media. Because again, coming at this um, as, a, as a yes sir, uh, it was clearly the case uh, that we faced an extraordinary uh, coordination between um, establishment and media and power and Whitehall uh, to really, to some degree, this is not, this is not part of the problem of uh, a, no, a no vote was the, I think, the kind of stiffness of the, of the SNP policy platform, but part of it was also uh, an absolute uh, regime of fear and, and a misinformation campaign coming down from the mainstream media. Now, um, it, there's been a lot of, there was a lot of uh, response, a lot of the movement's response was a media response. We've got to have a vibrant media and we've actually got to, to some degree, put our money where our mouth is. But our money goes uh, almost, as it were, further than, it's, than it went in the past. Um, you know, people, when you, when you sponsor um, a, 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 a yes or a, a, a grassroots up Scottish media organisation, it's a very lean organisation and it does a lot for your buck. Um, but I think it's answering a structural gap and it's answering a need for us to have um, a live uh, and a watchful media. And I'm, I'm happy for a thousand flowers to bloom in that um, because I think there's a lot of people who uh, don't need very much to produce incredible results. I mean, m my friend is sitting here who through National Collective managed to kind of nail Mr. Vitol, you know, from just like, so basically doing desk work that no other journalist was prepared to do. So I think that's one of the problems to which Commonweal is a solution. Um, uh, and, it, and it requires commitment, not just from uh, journalists, but from readers as well, and a different relationship between readers and journalists. And connect the policy element to that. I mean, add a think tank to a vibrant new media newspaper, and you've got a very, very powerful process there for illuminating, for educating, agitating, and organizing people. Um, and I think the third thing that Commonweal is a solution to is actually parties. I mean, I'm already have, I mean, I'm in, I don't know how many people joined a party the day after. I decided to join the Scottish Green Party the day, the day after the, the referendum. And I'm, and I'm already getting annoyed. I also I feel like a groucho Marxist, you know. I don't, I don't want to be part of a party that somebody wants me to be there, you know. <laughs> you know, and, and I'm... I mean, I'm, all, I'm practically, actually, really, I'm a Marxist, but I'm in a more feel more like a actual Marxist at the moment. And I, and I really don't, I'm wondering whether I should just leave because I don't like the way that, for example, you know, a Green is getting sniffy at an SNP not having a proper conversation with him. It's, it bores the absolute tits off me. It really does. So that, to that sense, that, that resumption of partisan party politics, when we know where the general consensus socio-economic consensus of Scottish life is, is extremely tedious to me. Um, and so we have to, again, really, um, if the spirit of the Yes campaign was this kind of pluralistic wave of innovation and energy and commitment and ideas and enterprise and people doing it for themselves, um, I, I think Commonweal is a great container for that. And if Commonweal is a kind of space where people have a party identity, but come here and allow themselves not to have a party identity and be able to sort of discuss these things and discuss how we realise the common real consensus in Scotland uh, with, with detail and with people who might have ideas from around the spectrum, that would be a good function for Commonweal as a place where you take your party hat off, but you're for the idea of, of, a, of a, a socially driven Scotland and a well-run Scotland and a, and a well-evidenced Scotland and a well-benchmarked Scotland. Uh, go, taking itself forward. Um, and the final, I can't believe John Coltrane hasn't gone yet, but anyway, the final, <laughs> the final point to make in this, 
would be, I think Commonweal is part of a much wider um, global movement. I think, the, for example, I mean, the relationship between the, 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 uh, the indignance of Spain about two, three years ago and Podemos now is absolutely direct. It's an absolute dotted line. And the indignants were basically organizing as much as they could locally, whether it was not just food banks, but it was also local currencies, and it was, and it was using spaces that hadn't been used properly before. It was um, you know, employment exchanges. It was basically a very, very autonomous culture in reaction to uh, the financial collapse of the, of the Spanish state. And that, I think that energy has gone into Podemos. Podemos doing incredibly well at the moment, but has a very, very consultative structure, very, very digitally enabled. Um, but not just that. I mean, one of the best stories I heard, and I actually found the solution to it, I was, someone told me halfway through the, the last months of the referendum campaign that the Kurds were really interested in the Yes campaign. Now, why would the Kurds be really interested, other than just in, a, in terms of a purely kind of uh, national liberationist basis? Well, they're actually, what, their leader is actually, who was an ex-terrorist um, who spent his time in jail reading uh, Mike Small from Bella Caledonia's Mentor's Readings, a guy called Murray Bookchin, who's a libertarian municipal, municipal, a libertarian municipalist anarchist. <laughs> so the leader of the Kurds is a libertarian municipalist anarchist, and they were really, really interested in what, in what the Yes movement was doing, this sense of people um, taking an agenda forward uh, that wasn't, uh, it was civic rather than ethnic, it was ideas, driven and attempting to be as inclusive as possible of all identities. Um, and I think that what I, I received a message from a very well-placed um, Channel 4 journalist, I think that's what I'll call him, who made it, ex made it very explicitly clear that uh, the yes vote, or what were the energies that were driving the yes vote, uh, were extremely uh, destabilizing uh, or threatening or kind of transformative, not just to uh, to the British state, but across a, a wider range of uh, territories and countries. The, I, think there's, I think the word enterprise, I think it's become a kind of secular word these days, and what it means is up for itness. So I think that's one of the, the range of organisations that you've talked about demonstrate an up for itness in Scottish <coughs> society and civic society, which, which, which means that people scrabble a wee bit and, and sometimes compete, but more often than not miraculously coordinate and sequence themselves. You saw that through the referendum, where you had funding or funding drives that were kind of magically, mysteriously, but nevertheless happening in sequence, so that people could get. I mean, and also, I mean, to be quite honest with you, one of the things that Wing Scotland did brilliantly during the campaign was to hypothecate his fundraising to the failure of the contemporary media. You know, mm. really, how much are you paying for the Daily Record a week? Dink, pay that for us. Now, I think that's a tactic that you learn from. But funny enough. You only develop these tactics in an ecosystem, you know, when you're trying things out, when you're failing and failing better and failing better. So we must keep that as a kind of an advantage. Mm -hmm. And just briefly on your point about local, um, one of the great crises of mainstream media is we don't have somebody reporting City Hall. I mean, it's the same all over. It's a systemic problem. It's what, it's what happens when the commercial model of the media fails and newspaper fails as the, the foreign office goes and then the City Hall reporting goes. So one of the things I hope that common space I'm going to partly talk about this in a minute, but one of the things that Hope Common Space does is to kind of really give another, um, with your help actually, with your subscription help, with the kind of wings over Scotland argument to be made about how you hypothecate, hypothecate your media spend, returns reporting to City Hall, I think it's incredibly important, but we need new models to mm. generate that, and I think coming off a movement is probably the only way that will answer that question, because certainly the old newspapers aren't going to do it because they're, they're on a death dive. <laughs> So we've got about 30 minutes to do a report back and rather than kind of go through all the questions, I think if you could give us your kind of top five ideas that came out of your group. Um, if anyone's got any other groups you think we should be collaborating with, maybe outside the usual suspects. So I think we all know like Radical Independence, Women for Independence, um, obviously all the political parties, uh, Generation Yes. But if anyone knows of other groups like community groups that might be worthwhile connecting up with in the South Side, I think that would be good to know. And then if you've came up with anything you think uh, the guys from the Commonweal can actually help us with, then I think that would be good to know. Um, so we can make this quite quick. Um, give us a volunteer group to go first. 
Oh, oh, the one at the back waving. All right, okay, okay. Well, number one, overwhelmingly, was poverty and what to do about it. Um, two, integration, inclusion, and how to overcome alienation. Three, literacy, computer literacy, general literacy, political literacy, a whole lot of meanings there. Um, four, communication between different community groups, so pulling ideas, knowledge, what do people want, how to take things forward. And five, education, somebody's talking about how, how to debate, so how to learn more about political structure, um, how to get that out there to younger people as well, people that were engaged in the referendum. Who's next? Okay, so we um, ended up with a top six. So <laughs> our first one was maybe some kind of idiot's guide to who your local elected officials are and who do you go to with certain issues? So is it your councillor? Is it your MP? Is it your MSP? Is it your MEP? Who is the person that you take these things to? And who is everyone's elected officials? And actually probably how they... How they've the roots to them and also how they've done in their job in the past. Have they actually done the things and voted for the things that you elected them for in the first place? Um, to a larger campaign probably on the unfair economics, the creating of debt, wealth distribution and something larger in that. Um, a living wage, promotion of a living wage for organisations and maybe moving towards the Commonweal's idea of the citizens' wage. Um, actually, part we participate in the local democracy structures that are already existing, so different Pollock Shield, Southside societies that make decisions, we attend them because no one in our group actually attended any of these types of meetings. So if we say that we want greater local democracy and participation, we actually have to participate in the structures that are already there and with a hope to maybe improving them and changing them. Um, how does Commonweal South organise ourselves? Maybe um, the interests that we all have, we'll all have different interests and is there subgroups that we can then go into and how does that look and how do we decide that? And finally, utilising community spaces, empty shops and the likes to one, improve our communities, but also to have meeting spaces to do things that we wish to do. Um, I'm going to pass over to Steph for local groups. Sorry, I was just trying to, just at the last point when you were saying list group, I don't think we really got to that list groups yeah. that you'd like to, us to collaborate with so outside of all the usual suspects. Just in terms of locally, I just started chucking some stuff together, but I don't know, what, what we could probably all just chip into that. Um, just off the top of my head, so the Southside Fringe is obviously quite established now. That's probably a good group to link to. Um, community groups like the Strathbungo group, the Battlefield group and the Queen's Park group are the ones that I know of on Facebook, but there's probably <laughs> loads more. Um, and then this whole Langside Halls Trust piece of work that's been going on with this whole Queen's Shaw and Civic Square and everything. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's a few groups that I know of, but there's probably tons more. That's the only ones that I could think of off the top of my head. Next. Um, one of the ideas we had was about um, local journalism, like maybe tying in with um, Sunny Govan Radio or Radio Awas that might have some good ideas about how we can organise and do the same thing or even do some stuff with them. Um, also, like local newsletters, like I live in Strathbungo and they've got a newsletter which is very useful there. Um, the second thing was canvassing, like getting the word about Commonwealth out there door to door. I think we could get a lot of volunteers to go around and talk to people about Commonweal. But one of the points that was made in our group was that it's not, it shouldn't be like a, a hard sell. It should be more a case of what issues are troubling you in the, in the community and more broadly, um, how would you like to see it addressed? Kind of in the same way that local councillors should do business. Um, another um, big one was supporting local business. Uh, for example, I've got a lot of great little places in my street, like um, uh, No Way Back Cafe and The Bungo and 
Locavore, particularly Locavore, actually, Locavore is amazing. Um, and to go there for your things as opposed to going to Tesco or hey. Evil yeah, Asda, yeah. Yeah. public. Yeah. <laughs> I won't be second foot in there again. Um, fourthly, uh, I, this was mentioned already, lo local groups linking together, um, getting a database, just like the last um, speaker was mentioning, getting a database of all the groups that have got a common vision for change, bringing them together into one place so that we can all link together. Just in that same kind of idea of the thousand butterflies, like we might all have different ways of doing things, but we do all share that same socio-economic socio vision for change. Um, and finally, a kind of broad point really about the empowerment of the community and a focus on participation. You know, like a lot of my friends wouldn't um, necessarily be interested in a lot of the individual policies, but they were very interested in the Yes movement. It's about how you keep that level of engagement up at perhaps a less accessible level, because everyone can attach to the independence idea, but how do you keep people interested in the general election and the Holyrood election and not losing that uh, sense of purpose that we had with the referendum? We weren't really that organised, to be honest with you, so I'll just, I'll try and relay what we were talking about there. Um, <laughs> I, we lost you as a referendum. Anyway, um, <laughs> so I've been told. Um, basically, we were just saying our main point is, and the whole point of us being here, is trying to reach out to the disengaged in the community. I think that like it's been mentioned before, it's the same kind of faces and the same kind of people you get to see. Uh, and obviously there's a lot of people involved and has been at, at this sort of political level, but that we really do need to get people into these sorts of groups and involved on the level they want to be and how they want to be. And like you were saying there, I think that the canvassing that um, was done during the referendum campaign got a lot of people out and a lot of people more involved, but maybe not to the level that would be best. Like you should be more involved and I think we do need to go back to people people aren't certain kinds of people aren't going to come to us probably we're going to have to go to them and kind of brand it in a way that they and not tell them what we think they should think but actually get their opinions um, and how they want us to do things or how they're going to get involved and do things that matter to them because I think a lot of the time we go into communities and tell them hey, this is how you get yourself out of poverty or, or this is how you do this when actually it's these kind of people that need to tell us, I don't know, because I, I don't live in, in walk in their shoes. But basically, that's what we're saying. I think we need to try and get that kind of engagement, um, and we need to get out to people like that to get them involved here. Um, and we're just seeing like, the sort of support we think we need is obviously space and resources to do that as well. Um, and the networking you can get from this sort of group is like really valuable as well. That was, I think, basically it. I think we would agree with just about everything you've already said, um, but the main thing, again, was just participa participation and having a physical space, and really, we really feel that, yeah, we just want to get away a little bit from always being online and the internet, and because a lot of us spend a lot of time in front of computers, so the physical space for us was really important. <laughs> And we were wondering if perhaps there might be, because obviously you need to bring people into this space, and we were thinking that might be an idea that maybe you could have a sort of skills-based register of people who would be happy to come and talk to us or do workshops or people we could call on to talk about different um, political awareness or book groups or like even workshops on like activist different activist workshops or poster creating workshops or just something to bring people into that space mm -hmm. so yeah i get a sense that capacity building seems to be a theme like people feel like we need help building our own capacity and um whether that's through campaign training activism training maybe creating some kind of hub where people can come together learn from each other but also bring in outside people um and you know i think we'd all be the stronger for it i think as a movement we would be far stronger if we we're better equipped so um, these are great are any other groups still to report back is that us is that everyone yeah cool guys well done
what we'll do is we'll try and take all of that all that feedback and try and distill it down online and then obviously there's about 750 people have liked our page online so hopefully those people I know woo look at us <laughs> but there's a lot of people who can't be here in this room tonight and it'd be great to kind of hear from them and see if those are areas that they want to concentrate on and then hopefully you guys have got a bit of a flavor for for what it means to maybe be part of the common wheel here in the south side um, and you want to get a bit more involved can you hear sure. it yeah um it's just I suppose it's just a wee point that we'd like to put forward for the next mm -hmm. meeting that you have and that is that what we, I, I think tonight's been brilliant, by the way, and I think that was really, really useful. I think um, what motivated all of us to come here is quite different in some ways. The things that really, I think there's a very common feeling in the room, which is brilliant, but there's things that really get ants in the pants of each individual person that wants to, um, and I think we need to capitalise on that. And what I'd like to see at the next meeting and be happy to work on anything with you if you want that yeah. is is to get into interest groups where we start to pledge commitment and action to Absolutely. the areas that we're specifically interested in and not yeah. not go through another generic point the next time no totally so one of the purposes of tonight was it was an opportunity the the board and the team were doing a tour they're mm -hmm. going to about 30 groups across scotland so um it was an opportunity for them to come along and for you guys to hear from them um, it was an opportunity for me to kind of get some help because I could do with some help as we kind of grow this group and this movement. Um, and it was to kind of find out some of the things that you guys would like to work on. Like some of the things on my heart are local banking, uh, f uh, food cooperatives, like a local community food hub, um, how we can do better on local democracy, you know, some of the things that came up. Um, and I think it's great that there's so many people with different interests. And so for the next meeting, and maybe we'll just come on to that, one, if people want to volunteer tonight or online or get in touch through the page, it'd be great to have like an organising committee or, or people who want to help out, um, whether that's helping put on the events, do social media, um, take the lead on a group on a specific issue um, that's coming out of tonight. I think that would be great because I actually think the next meeting, it'd be really good to start to meet in those little groups and actually concentrate on those things, potentially come back together, report back. Um, and I, I get the sense you can do so much in a big group, but there's also the need for smaller groups to meet and keep driving things forward. I mean, we don't want to be a talking shop. I think that definitely people want to move to action now.